Okay. Um, the main part of the meeting, which we're going to talk about at the end of this um, hour, is talking about disagreements that we may have, not only with our clients, but also with other agents and ways that we can overcome that and actually come through on the other side smelling like a rose. So I'm going to enlarge this. And first up today is, uh, I believe Dan is going to be speaking on behalf of Home Sell Mortgage. Good morning, Dan. Hey, good morning, everyone. I um, just wanted to cover something quickly. So obviously with the creative sales agreements that we're seeing out there with uh, buyers paying uh, sellers costs in some cases and, and you know, um, doing incentives and whatnot. One thing I wanted to point out, um, and we got this information down or handed down to us from the VA, is that in uh, no situation or no case can a buyer pay any of the seller's costs with uh, when you're using a VA loan for financing. So um, this is something that you know we had questions about, and we kind of ran it up the ladder to VA. They came back and said, you know, under no circumstances can a buyer utilizing VA financing pay any of the seller's costs. Uh, this kind of coincides with, you know, things that we've already known as far as the uh, the veteran cannot pay the broker fee. They cannot pay for the termite. Uh, so this just kind of coincides with that. So just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that um, just because, of, again, all the creativity that's out there right now with offers. Um, also, if you're utilizing any type of special financing programs, um, you know, I guess off the top of my head, I'd say anything such as like PHFA financing, um, you know, please make sure that you're talking to either James or myself, um, just for some logistics of that when you're putting together the contract, especially if there's any type of creativity going on. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure we're staying in with the compliance of those specific programs, because they do sometimes add a little bit of um, you know, additional requirements and compliance to, uh, to the whole deal. So again, if you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to either of us. And I'll be more than happy to uh, talk through the situation. Uh, that's all I have. James, did you have anything uh, to add to that? No, you covered okay. it. Okay, perfect. That's it. Thanks, guys. Uh, Dan, I love the way you use the word, a lot of creative things going on out there which I'm seeing a lot of creative things coming across my desk. I'm getting a lot of creative questions from agents. Uh, by the way, keep them coming. Um, it's interesting since the beginning of the low inventory marketplace that we've been in, I mean, we've dealt with a lot of different clauses or different scenarios that uh, at first glance, we thought, eh, I'm not quite sure this is gonna go. But after we check it out, like uh, with Dan, when we check with uh, Home Sale Mortgage, we find out that some of these things are okay to do. So the more questions we have, the better off we are in this marketplace. So keep them coming. Um, Sarah uh, with Home Sale uh, Settlement Services is with us this morning. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. Um, so I have a few things. One, I want to piggy off, or piggyback off of what Dan just said, and I want to make the agents aware there are certain fees, like he said, that the borrower cannot pay in a VA loan. One of them being commission. We have run into this where it's a for sale by owner. The owner does not want to pay the agent's commission. The buyer agrees to pay it. It's a VA loan, and the VA says absolutely not, and the agent's out of a paycheck. Um, so I just want to make sure that, it, that you as agents are aware of commission counts and that veterans are not allowed to pay it. Um, the other thing, my exciting announcement for today is starting, um, actually was effective on Monday, home sale settlement will be entering the settlement rooms again, as we were in the past, sitting down at the table. Um, we will allow buyers and sellers in the same room. However, if a client or any party is uncomfortable doing that, we will um, you know, respect that and we can do things in two separate rooms. All parties must still have a mask on um, as 
those are the building requirements also. And we will ask um, if somebody has a child, please try not to bring children if need be. We do understand there are situations, but since everybody will now be in the same room, um, just to make it a few less people would be very much appreciated. But moving forward, you'll see us in the closing room as we were before sitting at the table. So uh, yay, back to normal, kind of. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Thank you. I love that kind of, it's kind of. Um, yeah, we're gonna talk about some other um, protocol changes here in, in a second. Uh, first up though is James White with Home Sale Insurance. James, good morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to share uh, something uh, I had had uh, that came from one of uh, my insurance companies as well too, uh, about uh, higher inflation guard. Uh, increases on uh, homeowners policy. And I, I know this is probably nothing new to everybody as well too, but I was uh, uh, astounded at how high some of the uh, costs there were for reconstruction. So in this email, I got materials and retail labor. It averaged uh, about a 9.2% uh, percent increase from October of 2019 to October, 2020 uh, throughout the whole country. Uh, and also on here, it said lumber costs were the extreme outlier, seeing about a 60% increase. Uh, so things like uh, carpet, uh, interior trim, and drywall all increased uh, over 3% as well, too. So, you know, that is something that's definitely going to be uh, factored into the, the rates of insurance policies uh, in, in the future years to come as well, too. So unfortunately, that uh, that's uh, something that um, all homeowners are going to have to consider as well, too. So that was all I had for you today, and uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, James. And one thing I, I would want to mention with what James just said here, this particular week I had an agent from our office get in touch with me and said she is in the middle of a build job right now with her buyer client, and the builder, the builder's representative, got in touch with her and said, hey, just want to let you know, we are going to increase the price, the contract price of the home. Now, the agent got in touch with me. We looked at the paperwork. The builder doesn't have any right to do it in this particular case. So we're working through that. But I just wanted to make sure everybody is aware. You heard some of the staggering numbers that James just talked about as far as percent increase in building costs. Um, it, it's not... Uh, I would not put it past builders to start adding clauses in their agreements that say that they can change the price if, you know, um, building costs and materials go up uh, during the course of a build job. So if you are getting your buyer client involved, please make sure you look at the agreement of sale. In many uh, cases, it's a builder contract, not a standard PAR form. And the builder contract may have some of those um, some of those items in there. So make sure that you are aware when you're getting your client involved with a build job. Thanks, James. Next up, Jen Ravigum is here this morning. I talked with Jen this morning. Good morning, Jen. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Tom talked to me about what I should talk about today, and we didn't come up with anything, but. Um, here is what I thought you guys might want to know. So the question I've been getting a lot lately is what's going on with home sale? Um, because you guys are all out there selling houses and running a thousand miles a minute. And so um, sometimes a lot of the things that the company is working on are kind of behind the scenes and, and you don't see too much of them unless you're participating in a focus group or kind of getting some questions asked um, on the side of, hey, tell me a little bit about this. So a couple of things that I just want to update you on. So I think that maybe about a week and a half ago, there was a new announcement um, that Regina sent out that Don Fink um, has joined us as our new vice president of agent services. And I think that you're going to really enjoy some of the things that Dawn has been bringing to the table. Um, you know, she really has a strong belief um, that her position and the agent services team position is customer service and you guys are the customer. 
Um, so she is really working hard to put tools and pieces in your hand that are going to help you enhance and grow your business and give you the things that you really need uh, to, to get up and running. So you will be seeing some revamp of some of the things that we have in agent services. You'll be seeing some updates um, kind of going hand in hand with that. We do have um, the relaunch of Home Sales Center coming very soon. Um, and so Dawn has been integral in that, working with Sandra Tricoli um, and hoping that we can get that rolled out sometime in June. Um, and you're going to see a whole new platform there with some enhanced tools and updated documents um, housed in Home Sales Center. So we will be spending some time getting people into training groups and, and showing you what's there. Um, we have a real-time reporting system um, that is going to give your office managers, Tom and Colleen, the ability to pull up your numbers and statistics right there real-time. Um, and we are ready to launch that to the managers probably in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, so they will be able to actually see what's going on in your business and sit down during a coaching session and give you some real-time feedback versus us waiting till the end of the month that we've been doing in the past. Um, so we are all real excited for that. Um, we also have been working on a really cool um, update to our company branding. Um, so stay tuned. I think we're going to start rolling out some of those pieces over the summer. Um, we have an awesome session coming up with a uh, career development that is all about, so you think you want to build a team. Um, and if you want to build a team, here's some of the things you should be thinking about. And then there'll be additional sessions about, you know, actually planning for your team and where to grow. Um, so that's for those of you who aren't currently on a team, but maybe are considering starting a team at some point in your business. And it kind of gives you all the ins and outs of that. So that's actually coming up in June, the first session um, will be hosted by Bill Malloy out of our career development team and Brenda Drawbaugh. Um, the company is growing. So um, if you talk to Rod Messick, you know, put him right on the spot and ask him how many offices we have. It's fun to watch him try to count. Um, so we have a couple offices. Um, you all know that our LitIt satellite is pretty much open um, and that is available if anybody wants to meet clients in LitIt's. Uh, we have a couple things happening there construction-wise that are just getting done, um, but Janice can schedule that conference room for you if you want to meet with clients in um, Lidditz. And we also have some other uh, offices around our company, um, satellite offices that will be available coming soon. So stay tuned for that. Um, and the only other thing that I'm kind of throwing out there is we have a lot of programs that um, we are looking at as a company and deciding, is this the right program for us to keep? Should we rework it, relaunch it? How do we make it more exciting for you guys? Um, and so there's a couple things on the agenda that um, we're going to be working on over the summer and hopefully have some exciting new-ish products for you. Um, when the time comes. So there's a lot going on and um, I hope you're all doing well and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody soon. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate all the updates. Uh, there's, there is a lot that happens behind the scenes that we all don't see and we don't see the net result until it actually gets put in front of you. So it's great to hear some of the updates. Appreciate it. Just wanted to remind everybody that coming up uh, next Thursday, May 13th from 11.30 to 2 is our North Point Home Sale Agent Appreciation Day. Uh, we are going to have uh, it catered by Inx uh, Custom Catering. We're going to have beef tacos and fajita buffet. Uh, it's going to be chicken fajitas. Um, we were just in conversation um, actually yesterday or the day before with Lancaster Brewing Company. They are going to be there, which we did know. They're going to bring some assorted beers margaritas and then they're adding this specialty drink which I did review with Colleen and got her seal of approval. It's called a lemon lavender sangria. 
And I heard all the ingredients that went into it and kind of looked at Colleen and said, I'm not going to go there. And Colleen was saying, I'm going to take yours. <laughs> so uh, look forward to that. We're also going to have Lancaster Cupcake Truck there from 12 to 2. So you can get um, a, a nice lunch, a drink, and a dessert all at the same time. Once again, it's from 11.30 to 2. You don't have to be there for two and a half hours. Just stop down, uh, grab a bite to eat. We are going to have, and we have secured the um, uh, a vendor to uh, manufacture and make t-shirts for us. So we're gonna be taking t-shirt orders there for free. Uh, we do need everybody's size. So uh, either bulk up or lose some weight or whatever you wanna do, but we wanna get your size correct. So we're gonna have uh, a lot of stuff there for you to do. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for the weather. I know Colleen and I have uh, talked on uh, numerous times about some of the things that, that are gonna go on during that day. One of the things that Colleen was very concerned about when she was up in my office the other day after my all the, the birthday things that I got is she was concerned that Rodney disappeared. I'm here to say Rodney is alive and well and I'm beginning to turn into Rodney, I believe. So anyway, Rodney's still around. You do need to RSVP to Marion. Um, Marion has a running list. So if you haven't, um, if you haven't RSVP'd for this event, please do so to Marion. Once again, you don't need to be there the whole time. You could be there for 10, 15 minutes just to grab a quick plate to eat. And oh, by the way, to make it even easier for you to RSVP. If you haven't done it up to this point in time, just go to the chat box at the bottom, say, hey, I'd like to attend an RSVP. Uh, Colleen is going to man that chat, chat box and she'll forward all the names on to uh, Marion. If you have any questions, see either myself or Colleen. Wanted to make everybody aware of some policies that um, some of them have been in place, but now there's a new twist to it. This is one with a new twist. This actually just hit yesterday and won't go into effect until May 10th. But I wanted to make sure everybody's aware of this because if you do something that's not correct, it could get really expensive really quick. This is a Bright MLS's clear cooperation policy also having to do with broker exclusives. And by the way, I should mention that everybody focuses on Bright on this clear cooperation policy. This actually came from NAR, not Bright. Bright is just following through with what NAR wants uh, to put forth to all the MLSs out there. So it's not just Bright MLS. All the MLSs across the country have a clear cooperation policy. But here's the new twist to this. In the past, if you violated this policy, Somebody turned you in and said, hey, I saw uh, a property advertised, but I don't see it in the MLS yet. What would happen is Bright would get in touch with you and say, hey, I see this, but it's not in the MLS. You need to put it in the MLS. Uh, and then the agent would have 24 hours to do that. That is officially going away as of May 10th. As of May 10th, the broker, in other words, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Home sale realty gets one warning. One warning. I'm guessing that we're in May. We've already received our one warning. I'm just guessing. Um, so that's out the window. So if you get notified that you have violated this policy, your fine is $5,000. That is not a misprint. $5,000. If you do it a second time, it's $7,500. A third violation is termination of your subscription. So please, I talked to Janice this morning. She's aware of it now. So if she's getting listings that don't have some of this stuff, she is going to be on high alert to get in touch with you. We don't want to have these fines come down to you as agents. So just wanted to make you aware. May 10th is the day for this new uh, way that they're enforcing this policy. Another thing having to do with uh, your listing. Tom, Tom, I'm sorry. Remember when I said I was just going to interrupt you instead of having something to share? Yes, go can ahead. I just, <laughs> can I just add that please be aware that your errors and omissions insurance does not 
cover you for MLS violations and fines. So don't be thinking like, oh, I hope I don't screw it up, but I'm not going to pay much attention because I'll have errors and emissions. Um, that doesn't work that way. So, you know, your responsibility is to make sure that you know what the policies are um, before you violate them. So just wanted to make sure you're aware of it. Thank you. Good point. And continue to keep interrupting me as I, as I miss things, Jen. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, showing time also has something now called showing buffers, which is a little different. Now, what this is going to allow you as an agent, you have the ability when you turn in your listing or you enter your listing and you get into showing time, you can request obviously no overlapping showings. And we highly encourage that until we get well through this pandemic. However, you do have the ability right now, either yourself or if you uh, talk to Janice, she can put in buffers for you in increments of 15 minutes in between showings up to a max a maximum of 60 minutes. So it's it's there for you. The issue is showing time is different than bright MLS. So if you're looking at the bright MLS input sheet and looking for the spot on there that says, well, where can I put that there's a buffer here? I'd like to put a buffer here. It's not there. You're gonna have to tell Janice this yourself personally or put a note with your listing that you would like a buffer uh, between showings. So I wanted to make uh, you aware of this. This is effective essentially right now. So if you want to change some things with your listings, you can certainly do that. Just like Sarah is changing some of the home sale settlement office protocols regarding the way, way they are handling settlements, we're doing the same. And these are effective tomorrow some of these I have reviewed with some of you already, but I wanted to make sure everybody is aware of them. First of all, as of tomorrow, no temperature check upon entering the building. Visitors do not have to fill out a contract tracing form at the front desk anymore. Janice has been doing a yeoman's job doing both temperature checks and the contract tracing and getting those things filled out. I really appreciate all her efforts during this period of time when we've had to go through this. It's just one more extra thing that she had to do at the front desk. So thank you, Janice, for doing that. And because there's no temperature checks, your key cards will open all exterior doors starting tomorrow, which should make everybody pretty happy. So I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of those. I also want to say now that I've shared some things that are changing. Here are some things that are still the same. Masks are still required in all common areas. So as you are walking around the building at the copier, um, going to and from uh, you know, appointments in the conference rooms through the lobbies, your mask is still required. Masks are still required in the conference rooms. Just like uh, Sarah said earlier, even though a home sale settlement is going to go into those conference rooms right now, that doesn't mean you can take your mask off. Please keep your masks on. The only exception to this in North Point is if you're utilizing the training room, you may remove your mask. However, we're asking a couple of things. Maintain safe social distancing in there. Now that's a big, big room. So maintain it. I've been conducting kind of new to business and veteran agent interviews in there. We're actually sitting across the room from each other, taking our masks off. So that is okay to do. In addition, try to limit the number of people if you're holding a meeting there to plus or minus about 10, 10 being on the high side. Uh, you'll see that the room is configured in a giant rectangle right now as far as the, as far as the tables and chairs are concerned. So if you're going to utilize that room, please spread out, okay? So those are some things that we're going to change here at North Point Effective tomorrow. Also wanted to remind you about uh, Team Builder. Um, I received this past week three Team Builder checks, one for Kathy Morgan, one for Susan Allison, and one for Lisa Miller. Uh, these checks will be in your respective mailboxes. 
once again, team builder is real easy to utilize. Uh, the brochures are all over the office. Uh, if you run into an agent from another company that you think would be a great fit here at North Point, and you talk to that agent about, put their name into a team builder application, forward it on to me, and between you and me, we can arrange an appointment to meet. And the net result of that is if this agent or team joins the company, then you can benefit from them financially with their commission checks. Keep in mind, it's not coming out of the other agent's commission check, it's coming out of the company side. So want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Team Builder, keep it on the radar. So this past week also, one of our, um, one of our trainers um, put out a video, short video having to do with seller reports and some of the, some of the changes that were made to the seller report. So I wanted to play this for everybody because I think some of the things that are uh, that she focuses on here, Stephanie, that is, are really good. The other thing, the reason why I wanted to play this is I do hear from people in our office from time to time that when I say, have you given or you sent the seller report to your um, uh, client and they look at me like Rodney and say, what seller report? So if you don't know what a seller report is, listen up here to Stephanie. She does a nice job here. Hi, I'm Stephanie Eckert, Director of Career Development here at Home Sale Realty. And today I want to share with you two really great features, new features to our Home Sale Center Seller Weekly Reports. So part of the issue with the Seller Weekly Reports that we were hearing from agents was that it was often forgotten. It was hard to remember to go and turn them on for our sellers. So the new feature is that the Seller Weekly Report is automatically created as soon as the system becomes aware of your listing. And then it's designed to send you an email notification letting you know that the Seller Weekly Report is ready and prepared. And all you need to do now is go attach it to a customer. So really, really helpful, automatically generated. And then you just get that notifier and you need to go set it up. So I'm going to show you how to do that. We'll be starting in the Home Sales Center where we would normally be going to set up a Seller Weekly Report. And I'm going to go here to the left sidebar menu and click less listings. And then we're going to active listings. And this is where you could see all of your current active listings and pending listings and be able to do marketing tools on each one separately. I'm going to direct your attention to this right side button that says notification settings. And this is where we're going to turn on that notifier. We are going to enable by clicking this little toggle on the status, enabling the system to automatically create that seller report for every new listing that it's picked up by the system. You're then going to decide when you want that to begin. So which day of the week should you have the seller report created and sent to your client? So if I schedule this for a Tuesday, then when Tuesday rolls around, I'm going to get that email notifier that says, hey, Steph, your seller report is ready to go. Go ahead and set this up on, with a client so that it will email out. And then every Tuesday following, my seller would get their report. And then I would just decide which frequency. Am I going to leave it at weekly? Can I, do I want to change it to biweekly or monthly? And you also can change the default report criteria. So you can limit it to a location. You can also limit the number of properties that are sent with the report. So if I'm doing it weekly, maybe I only want the last seven days worth of information. Okay, so that is up to you. And that will be the default for every automatic report that's created. Then I'm going to hit save. And just like that, I now have an automatic seller report notification setting. And every new listing will have an auto-generated report and an email will come to me asking me to attach it to a customer. So the email that comes to me looks like this. It's coming from customer service at homesale.com where all of our home sale center notifications come from. And the subject line will read something along the lines of seller report for either a person or a property address. And then you'll see in the actual report, it says this report was not sent to any customers. This is just your email notification giving you the heads up that this report is ready. It's all set up to go. 
you just need to add which customer is supposed to get this report. And it gives you a very quick link that you can click to go back into Home Sales Center and add the customer so that it has the right email address to send it to. And then it will move forward on its own without any further um, clicks from you. So that's the first new feature of the Home Sales Center Seller Weekly Report. The next one is that you are now able to create a seller report on any listing, not just your own. So this is gonna be really helpful for admins who do set up the marketing pieces for agents, for team admins who are doing it on behalf of their team members, or for team members themselves where the listing agent is typically the lead agent on the listings, but you wanna be able to brand all of the marketing pieces to yourself. So it just kind of depends under what circumstances you would need to do that. Just keep in mind that whatever account you are logged into is who is going to get branded on the seller report. So an admin, for example, would need to log into that specific agent's account to set this up so that that agent is who is branded to it. Um, with a team member, for example, they would need to be logged into their own account and then they can search for their team leaders uh, listing. So if I click the create seller report button, you can see it just pops up to find a listing and I'm going to find one that is not mine. When I start typing, here comes that active listing. I can connect to it and continue. And then this seller report is going to end up being branded to me with me and then I would send it to the seller uh, with all of my personal branding, but it would be another person's official listing. So hopefully that helps uh, ease some of those issues with the seller weekly report. Uh, just as a quick recap, A, don't forget that now it sends you an email notifier letting you know that your report is ready to go and you just need to forward it to the correct customer. And B, you are now able to set up a weekly report on any listing. So this is going to be especially helpful for admins and others who are doing the marketing pieces for someone else's listings. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, you can reach out to one of the directors of career development or your office manager. We're always here for you and we will see you again soon. Thanks so much. There we go. So Stephanie does a great job. Um, all our career development uh, people do a great job. <clears throat> These are great enhancements. If it's been a while since you've utilized this seller report, uh, get in there and play around. So the second thing I wanted to review today is talking about CMAs in general. And um, I know our company, we have cloud CMA that we provide for you. It is a fantastic tool. Uh, if it's been a while since you've utilized that, get in there set up all the uh, personalized stuff that so it's branded to you. But I'm actually going to talk about a different type of question here today, which is, is a CMA really that valuable right now? And, th and that sounds like a horrible question. And most agents will say, well, of course, it's valuable in today's market. Well, I'm going to get you to rethink that a little bit. And keep in mind, I should have underlined the word today's market not necessarily in a year. So what is the purpose of a CMA? And I had two reasons why I know I used to do CMAs. Really, it was to assess the marketplace to see what the similar homes have sold for to maximize the return to the seller, and then also to reduce the probability that the home will, or excuse me, that the home will not appraise for financing purposes. I wanted to make sure that I didn't get a, a fall through after the fact once we got into the financing part of this. Well, I'm gonna share with you two current market stats to consider as you're thinking about these CMAs from this point on, at least for the, for the short term. Number one, the average sale price from March of last year to March of this year is up over 12%. I mean, it is big. And those numbers aren't slowing down at this point in time. Now, when they start to slow down and it drops under double figures and gets back to a more normal range, this doesn't become as important. But think about this. You know, we're told as agents, you know, use comps six months to today. Well, if you think about using a comp from six months ago, think about that 12.8%. Think about what that does to the value. 
And the second thing is, I looked at the market stats, 21% of the transactions um, in the first quarter of 2021, 21% were cash transactions that aren't even getting a mortgage. In addition to that, I'm guessing, and this is a gut feeling, and I think it's I think it's conservative. I believe most of the transactions that I see coming across my desk have no appraisal contingency in there, or they are saying, listen, we're going to limit, you know, we'll, we'll go on up a certain amount. So between the two, 40% of our transactions aren't contingent upon an appraisal. 40% plus or minus. And once again, I think that's conservative. In the past, as an agent, we would constantly say, I would say it myself, we would say to our clients, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, seller, but this property probably isn't going to appraise for that amount. And I'm here to tell you today, at this time, probably doesn't matter because there is not going to be an appraisal. Now, yes, the lender's going to order an appraisal, and there are some caveats here, but you don't need to be as concerned as you once were. So the takeaways, appraisals actually look backward. They aren't looking forward. And that's the way it's always been and probably the way it is going to continue into the future. But in the market that we're in today that is so fast, it's almost impossible not to look into the future. Don't be so concerned about your listing not appraising. Most listings that are going under agreement, you just saw a second ago, 40% of the, the offers that you're getting are either cash or have no appraisal contingency on them at all. So when utilizing a CMA, understand who you are working for. Are you working for the seller? Because a CMA today for a seller, not as valuable. Now it's gonna get you in the right ballpark to list the property, but I've heard dozens of agents come to me and say, I listed this at 250 and I just got a cash offer at 312. They're just dumbfounded. So it's not as valuable to a seller today. I am gonna flip the switch here though and say, I think you ought to be using them with buyers. You ought to be using these with buyers and saying, listen, if you're gonna make a, an offer on a property, this is what the market is saying. If you wanna go over that, you need to understand that the value may not, or the, the market may not uh, catch up to that value for a couple of months. So I think it's valuable to utilize with buyers, not necessarily sellers at this point in time. So I'm also gonna play here some really short video clips from a documentary called Long Island Divided. Now this, I think a lot of agents are aware of, if you've never either read the report or looked at the 40 to 50 minute video, I would highly encourage you to look at it. It's very eye-opening. It was a three-year investigation that was done on Long Island, had 25 undercover tester testers that were trained um, to test agents, had 93 real estate agents that were tested, and had 240 hours of meetings that were secretly recorded. I've coordinated more than 12,000 investigations across the country. I have personally done over 1,500 tests. I've been named as a witness in 400 fair housing lawsuits, and I've testified 56 times in state and federal courts around the country. So yes, I have some experience. <laughs> okay. We relied on the judgment of two nationally recognized experts in the fair housing field. All we're asking in these tests, you've got two people who come in and ask for exactly the same thing. Why don't you give them the same listings? Why don't you uh, pre-qualify them in exactly the same way? It's not that big a burden. The scope of Newsday's investigation was quite extensive. It matches what most levels of government would ever do and certainly is more than any media organization ever did. The tests were designed in such a way as to reflect virtually the entire population and almost all of the geography of Long Island. The 10 test zones we picked all together, more than 80% of Long Island 
lived there. We wanted to cover areas where a large group of minorities lived closely to a large concentration of whites. We also wanted to look at areas where million dollar homes were readily available and those areas covered the Gold Coast and also the Hamptons. Another type of test zone covered Western Nassau, a highly populous area. A different type of test revolved around highly rated schools and affordable homes. Newsday's tests focused on the 12 largest real estate brokerages on Long Island. The very familiar names, the most heavily advertised. They account for more than half of the listings on Long Island. Once we narrowed down the real estate companies we wanted to pick, the agents were picked at random. When we sent out testers, they would go in unannounced. Most times the receptionist had assigned whichever agent that was available that day. For the second half of the test, we would then follow up with the same exact agent. Throughout Newsday's investigations, our testers received more than 5,700 house listings. We started with 109 paired tests across Long Island. We had to verify that they were, in fact, accurate, fair tests. Did the testers engage with the real estate agents in equal ways? Did both sides of the test both make the same request? If they did not, that's not a fair test, and it would have to be eliminated. Through that process, we winnowed the number of valid tests down to 86 tests that match white and black, white and Hispanic, and white and Asian buyers. The primary question that we were trying to answer was whether the agents provided equal service to both testers in every test. Was one side provided with more listings than the other? Also, and critically, where were those listings placed? As permitted by law, Newsday recorded all meetings between testers and agents and then transcribed the recordings. What was before? Now you have a bad school district and, and that's not good for resale value. Matching those tests, mapping the listings, and relying on the judgment of fair housing experts you start to get a picture of whether an agent, or more importantly, agents at large across Long Island, engaged in different treatment of testers. I'm looking to speak to an agent about purchasing a home. I'm an agent, I can talk to you. Oh, great. New York is a one-party state which means that only one party to a conversation has to consent to a recording. All good. So a men had body cams affixed to their chest. It was a buttonhole camera. Women used cameras hidden in their purses. That allowed us to record as evidence what transpired between the testers and the agents. Bayshore has two school districts, Brentwood and Bayshore. You don't want to have Brentwood school districts. The testers all went through a day-long training course where they learned how to be fair housing testers. I was just wondering if there's anyone available. Uh, Typically for a tester, the day would start with them making a phone call to the agency that we wanted to test. The tester would have to memorize the details of the profile. What was your name again? Patrick. Uh, are you pre-qualified? No, not yet. That's a tough one. We're both new. How did you hear about us? You guys are close to the city. I mean, we went over and over again. What's your tester name? What's your age? How much money do you have in the bank? What's your credit score? How long you've been working at your employer? What's your wife's occupation? What's your child's name? All to build their confidence so that when they hit the street, you were ready to go out with the recording equipment. They were ready to play that role. It's about 10 after 2 and I'm uh, in my car. So it's Richard Helling testing as Matt Browning on May 3rd. The testers were are a diverse group of people, white, black, Hispanic, and Asian. They range from a 20-year-old college student to 60s pro bono attorney. We did make use of a significant number of actors. The things actors do for work. It's really <laughs> When the tester beats with the agent, they're basically saying in broad terms what their housing search is. What is your price range? What do you think that you want to start at? Uh, 500000 Okay. When you send in a tester, 
they have no idea what's happening on the other half of the test or what their counterpart experienced when they went to the same agent at the same agency. It was really unique and interesting for us to bring the testers together and tell them what happened. Did I hear right? She received 18 listings. There's nothing subtle about the difference. They are the segregators. I mean, I, <laughs> so I have some opinions now. about this. <laughs> So the, the net result of this study, and by the way, it was, it was gone over with a fine tooth comb to make sure that you, you heard that, you know, there were certain tests that were taken out because, you know, some of the uh, actors, as you heard, didn't say the exact same thing. But this is what, at the end of the day, the results showed. 19% of the time, Asians received unequal treatment. 39% of the time for Hispanics and 49% of the time for Blacks. So I would highly encourage you, if you haven't seen this, here is the website, newsday.com forward slash divided. You can see the entire 40, 50 minute video. You can also read the report of how this was done, um, you know, what happened, it does also follow up and show what happened after the fact when they approached the agents or the brokerages and told them, this is what we found out about your specific situation. It was interesting to see some of the reactions there also. So, you know, what do we get out of this as agents? We're not in Long Island, we're here in Central PA. First thing you need to be aware as an agent is, and you heard it in the video, in Pennsylvania, you need consent of both parties to record. That's not the same in New York. New York, you only needed the, uh, the consent of one party. So you don't have to worry in Pennsylvania about you being recorded uh, by a tester. Most real estate classes, and I've taught a lot of real estate classes, both new to business and, and uh, uh, continuing in, they cover laws. They don't cover real life. So it's interesting when I do my pre-licensing classes and we, I teach the book which talks about fair housing laws and things like that. I then set aside the book and I give my students probably about a half a dozen scenarios in real life of what they may run into. You would be amazed, shocked, kind of incredulous at times, some of the answers that I get, but it's better to handle it in a classroom setting than in real life. So what can we do as agents or brokerages? First of all, these are some actions that we could do. First of all, if you find yourself in a situation that you're just not sure of, and it may involve fair housing, see me right away, see Colleen, see Jen, talk to us about the situation that you're finding yourself in. Number two, set up procedures for yourself and stick to them. Do you pre-qualify everybody before you take somebody out? Do you make sure that they get a pre-qualification letter? Are you treating people of different uh, ethnicities the same way? If you think you're being tested, let your broker know. I won't get into it here, but I was tested my first year in the real estate business. If you want a good story, come and talk to me and I'll talk to you about how I was tested and what the net result was. Keep good contemporaneous notes. Because things can't be recorded, if you have a funny feeling that you're being uh, tested, remember the questions that were asked. Remember what you said. What did you give them? Take the notes now while it's fresh in your memory. And never compromise your integrity. Um, I mean, I've been in front of probably in my real estate career, probably not quite a half a dozen, maybe three or four, uh, mainly sellers who basically, when I reviewed the listing contract said, you mean I have to sell to this type of person? And then I'd have to talk with them about fair housing laws, what it would mean to them, what it would mean to me, my brokerage, those type of things. If you're looking for language on that, once again, please see myself or Colleen, we'd be happy to help out. So I highly encourage you take a look at this report Take a look at the video. Some of the things are pretty eye-opening. So finally, I have a, a short video here. 
that talks, uh, it's a woman who made a presentation on TED Talks. I love TED Talks because they're usually really short and they get right to the point and it's, uh, there's usually some really good information. And this woman is really good at what she does. So I'm going to finish up here, um, take another two minutes, and I know we're running a little bit over here. Are, are you still trying to persuade people this way? Yell and scream at them and, you know, you, your voice goes up and then their voice goes up and then before you know it, you're more entrenched in your position. Think of the three things that she said that you do in these um, uh, discussions that you approach. The first one was, she said, choose curiosity curiosity over clash. And the statement that she said that she uses is, I never thought about it exactly that way before. What can you share that would help me see what you see? In other words, the other person gets to share their beliefs. You're being more curious about them, they'll be curious about you. The second thing was treat the discussion like a like climbing a wall, not a cage fight. You're not going into this with a buyer, a seller, uh, an attorney, or somebody else in a transaction where it's got to be all or nothing. You have to listen to the other side, have that curious mind as to why they have the position that they do. And third, have an anchor in purpose. Sometimes you need to go to the very end and figure out what are you both trying to accomplish? Uh, is the seller trying to sell their home? Is the buyer trying to buy a home? If that's the case, you have something to anchor in purpose. It's just how you get there that is the issue. So hopefully you can take something out of what she said here. I thought it was fascinating. And I'll leave you with this comic right here. I thought this put everything into a nutshell and explained it beautifully. Here you have a guy that's standing either on a mountain or an iceberg, and he can see the positions of the people. But what he can't see are the interests that cause those positions. And what you need to get at when you're working with people that you have these tough discussions to make or have is find out what the interests are, and then you can get back to the position. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for staying with me an additional three, four minutes. Talk to you soon. Take care.